Another thing that comes up in this situation of blended families is stepchildren's inheritance rights. A lot of blended families that I work with have the second marriage has lasted 30 or 40 years, right? And But that doesn't mean that they don't have children from a previous marriage. And that also doesn't mean that the kids that are in the second marriage that may have been very young when the couple got together are basically like the, the stepdad or stepmom's kids, right? So they want to treat them just like everybody else, right? They don't want to differentiate there. It's important to make sure that if that's the case, that we're very specific in saying, well, if they're not your children, if they're stepchildren, if they're not your biological or adopted children, you want to make sure that you're specifically designating things to them or specifically giving them a portion of an estate so that they can actually get an inheritance. You are listening to the Legacy Talk podcast hosted by James A. Jones, attorney at law and founder of Sound Legacy Law, PLLC in Tacoma. Attorney Jones is here to talk about how to best protect your family, assets, and wealth. Pulling stories from his more than 20 years of helping families and business owners protect their assets, create their estate plans, preserve their wealth, and plan for the future. Nobody wants to think about estate planning, but life has a way of sneaking up on you. And at any moment, something unexpected could happen that will leave you regretting not having acted sooner. So join attorney James A. Jones in the Legacy Talk podcast and together learn how to plan for your future today and have peace of mind tomorrow. Welcome to Legacy Talk. My name is James Jones. I'm an estate planning and probate attorney from Tacoma, Washington. I've been practicing over 20 years and my main practice areas are estate planning, probate, and estate administration. On Legacy Talk, we discuss topics surrounding families and estates. Estate planning is often a confusing and complicated topic. So my goal with this podcast is to make it accessible and understandable to those who need it. So if this is something that interests you, I'd appreciate it if you click the subscribe button and like this episode so that you can follow along as we break down the barriers to estate planning. I'm excited to get to today's topic. Today's topic is blended families navigating estate planning with stepchildren and ex-spouses so that you can avoid common mistakes and issues that arise in estate planning due to these issues. So on today's show, we're talking about blended families navigating estate planning with stepchildren and ex-spouses. So let's get to it. Unfortunately, we live in a society where divorce is a common occurrence. It becomes a common issue with estate planning as well, right? So we look to address this continuing topic when we set up estate plans with my clients. Issues with second marriages, stepchildren, and ex-spouses can really complicate a plan and oftentimes become the most contentious cases where an estate is administered. One thing that's consistent in estate cases is the idea of outsiders. Outsiders in this context are stepchildren, older children from a previous relationship where there's younger children from a new relationship, and ex-spouses, to name a few. When these potential issues are not adequately prepared for and planned for, it's not great for families and often leads to litigation. So today we're going to be discussing some things to consider and look out for when making these plans when these are issues that surround your estate. Okay. So the first thing that we want to talk about in these mixed families or blended family issues is that there might be inheritance disputes. There's often conflicts between stepchildren and biological children regarding the distribution of assets in the estate. The first thing that's something to do in this regard or to prevent this is to have clear communication within the family, those well-drafted, specifically drafted estate planning documents that are crucial to alleviate these risks, okay, and these disputes. Complex family structures often require careful consideration where everyone's needs are addressed, okay? And addressing these concerns can prevent these conflicts down the line. So when you have a couple kids from a previous marriage and you maybe you're in a new relationship, we want to talk about these issues with our family, right? We want to talk about this with the older kids and the younger kids. We don't want to make each other outlaws. So that's some things to consider there. The next thing to consider is rights of ex-spouses, okay? In the absence of properly executed legal documents, ex-spouses may have a claim against the decedent's estate, okay? 
we want to clearly define wishes of ourselves, right? With regard to what happens with our ex-spouse. And this is also true of spouses where we're separated. And we'll get into that a little bit later in this podcast. But we want to make sure that if you're divorced, take a look at this stuff. Okay. Another thing that comes up in this situation of blended families is stepchildren's inheritance rights. A lot of blended families that I work with have the second marriage has lasted 30 or 40 years, right? And But that doesn't mean that they don't have children from a previous marriage. And it also doesn't mean that the kids that are in the second marriage that may have been very young when the couple got together are basically like the, the stepdad or stepmom's kids, right? So they want to treat them just like everybody else, right? They don't want to differentiate there. It's important to make sure that if that's the case, that we're very specific in saying, well, if they're not your children, if they're stepchildren, if they're not your biological or adopted children, you want to make sure that you're specifically designating things to them or specifically giving them a portion of an estate so that they can actually get an inheritance. The rights of stepchildren in Washington, at least, are not automatic. They're not like normal biological children or adopted children. They're different and they're not treated as your children at all if they're not your children. Okay. So we want to specifically address what they would get. If we want to treat them in a certain way, we want to spell it out. Another thing to consider in a second marriage type situation is prenuptial agreements. So prenuptial agreements are good for a couple of things. When you're getting into a second marriage, oftentimes you'll get a prenuptial agreement if there's significant assets, or if you want to keep things separate, which is very common. Each new spouse wants to keep their estate separate from the other spouse, considering they just went through a divorce in many cases. And if there's already a prenuptial agreement in place, we want to make sure that the estate planning reflects what that prenuptial agreement asks for. So sometimes in the second marriage, the new spouse isn't provided for at all, right? Each spouse says, well, I'm, I'm not going to give anything to my current spouse. There's enough there for them. I'm going to give everything to my children from a previous marriage and they'll the other spouse will do the same in most cases, if that's the situation. So that's something that we want to make sure is clearly spelled out and represents what's in a prenuptial agreement in that case. The next thing to consider, okay, and this is something to consider if you're getting separated or if you get divorced or if you're thinking of getting divorced, is to update beneficiary designations at each stage, okay? Failure to update beneficiary designations on bank accounts insurance, retirement accounts can lead to unintended consequences. If you don't update these beneficiary designations when you're separated, and then again, if you're divorced to the way that you want them, you may be giving your ex-spouse or separated spouse your life insurance or your bank account or something like that. You want to regularly review at each stage, like I said, so that when you're initially separating, I say, look at that stuff, right? When your divorce is finalized, you want to look at that stuff. When the divorce is filed, you want to look at that stuff and change it so that things go the way you want them to go. Because you would think if you're getting divorced or separated or are divorced, you probably don't want your ex-spouse to get your life insurance. You probably want that to go to your kids or your friend or your mom, right? So look at that. When you're separated, review and revise. When your divorce is final, review and revise, okay? The next thing to look at is guardianship issues and custody issues, right? If you're divorced, you want to make sure that you still provide guardianship info. The divorced spouse typically retains parental rights in the majority of cases, but that doesn't mean that you don't want to or don't have to put a guardian in because something could happen to both of you, right? So typically if it's a spouse that's divorced spouse, the parent of the child usually has first rights if something happens to the other parent, regardless of custody, usually. But we want to make sure that there's an alternate there just in case. Okay. So that's something that's still important to consider. And clarity there is important because we don't want the court to be the one that determines that. Okay. The last thing, and probably the most important thing, as far as how we want our estate distributed, okay, is to review and update our estate planning documents. When you get married, if this is your second marriage, make sure that you review your estate planning documents, okay? What is the plan for the new spouse? Are we going to give them basically everything when we die? Are we going to give them something in trust when we die? Are we going to skip them entirely like we mentioned before and give everything to the kids? What happens there? So we want to think about that. A lot of the time, 
you know, if it's a second marriage and there's assets on both sides, we want to make sure that the assets go to a spouse, stay in the family, right? A lot of the time we want to make sure that the spouse that inherits assets from us has access to those assets, but when they pass away, they don't necessarily go to their kids, right? So a lot of the time what we'll do is create a trust for that person that they can often manage themselves, or maybe there's a co-trustee with them or someone else's trustee that allows them to benefit from those funds. But when they pass away, those assets remaining would go to your children, okay, rather than their children. A big issue that comes up all the time in second marriages with simple estate planning, where it's just a will or something, and, and they really, a lot of the time, don't go to an estate planning attorney. They go to somebody that does anything that walks in the door, or they try doing it themselves. And they say, well, I've got a simple estate, and we each have a couple kids, and the will says, when I die, give everything to Martha, right? <laughs> or give everything to Bob when Martha dies, right? And so what that means is, when Martha dies, Bob often changes his will and takes Martha's kids out, okay? And that might just be a natural thing because they're not thinking about it at that point. Maybe their kids say, well, mom, why are you giving, or dad, why are you giving Martha's kids all this money? They got money from when she died or for, they'll get money from their dad, right? A lot of the time you want to make sure that if you want to make sure that your kids get your part of the estate, that money is put in trust and managed for the benefit of the surviving spouse, but we don't want to make it so that they can use all that money or ultimately determine where the rest of it goes when they pass. Okay. We want to make sure that's something that is unchangeable. It was an irrevocable trust. So what the other thing to consider, what are you doing with the stepkids? And we talked about that before. Are we treating them like all the other kids? Are we treating them at all? Right. Are we giving them anything? Cause they might get it from their other mom or dad. Right. So a lot of the time they're not getting anything from your estate. That's something to consider and be specific about when you separate from your spouse, review your estate documents. Okay. If you don't have estate documents like a will or a trust, get them. Okay. An old will that names a spouse will not work if that spouse is not with you anymore. Okay. When you get separated, it doesn't change the way that your will goes. Okay. So say for example, Bob and Martha get separated. Okay. And Martha has a will that she created with Bob and they're separated five years or something. And Martha dies. She's still got that will with Bob. Bob still gets everything despite them being separated. There's not a legal separation or divorce that will still in effect. Okay. So if Martha doesn't want Bob to get everything, she needs to change that will. Okay. The other problem is Maybe Martha was married before and she has a, a will where she was married to Ted and she gets divorced from Ted. She keeps that will. And so when she dies, even though she's separated from Bob, that will doesn't mention Bob. So Bob's going to come in and say, well, that will's from before. I'm not named. There's such a thing as omitted spouse, which comes into play where Bob, even though he's not married and they've been or not mentioned and they're not together, they're separated, but they're not divorced, he would potentially be able to get the omitted spouse's share, which is basically what he would have gotten had Martha died without a will. Okay. So if she, Martha's still using Ted's will that she had with Ted, and now she's just divorcing Bob too, or separating from Bob too, Bob potentially could get half of that estate, even though, or all of it, if it's community property, if he's not mentioned. Okay. And so the next thing to do too, so you want to change your will when you get separated. You also want to change your will when you get divorced or when you start a divorce. And you want to say, for the same reason we just talked about with Bob and Martha, we want to say, I'm married to, but I'm separated from Bob, okay? Or I'm married to, but separated from Martha in Bob's case. So, and I'm not giving them anything. I'm specifically disinheriting them, okay? So we want to make sure that's clear Otherwise, this omitted spouse thing comes into play and it's a mess. If you're in a dis divorce proceeding, you want to also change your documents. So if you're separated, getting separated, change your will. If you're starting a divorce, change your will, okay? If that's what you want to do. If you want your spouse, your soon-to-be ex-spouse to not get anything, change those documents, okay? 
here's a story. We're, we're story time. I've got a bunch of clients, right? It's very common to talk about that scenario where Bob and Martha were married. Martha dies and Bob changes the will. He gets everything, of course, outright and free of trust, no restrictions. He changes the will to go to all of his kids, nothing to Martha's kids or vice versa, right? That's very common. And even in the most simple estates, maybe it's a few hundred thousand bucks, you know, which is not a massive estate, but it's still money, right? It's still something. Even in simple estates, the solution to that problem is usually a trust, right? To hold the, to the surviving spouse's share until they pass. And then the remainder can go to the surviving kids from a previous marriage or relationship. We want to make sure that is something that doesn't happen, right? We don't want to have money go away from our kids from our new spouse, right? We want to have some control there. Okay. So here's the story though for this episode. So I have a client and we're working through a probate case. All these bad stories come from probate cases where I get someone else's work and we're trying to figure out the problem. Janine died. My, the deceased person is named Janine for these purposes. She had a will like the previous thing that we talked about from a previous marriage. Okay. So Janine had this will from a previous marriage. Maybe his name was Ted. That's our previous spouse's preferred name on this episode. Janine's spouse, Ted, and her got married. And then they got divorced. They did a will. Janine did a will. Then they got divorced. Janine got remarried to Howard. And so she didn't change the will that she had with Ted. So she says, I want everything to go to Ted. I want these people to be executors. And it doesn't mention Howard. Okay. And so in this case, what's happening is Howard and Janine were married for just a short period of time. They were married for four years. Okay. Before she died, they were married for four years. They lived or were in this marriage technically for a very short time, about two years. And they were separated, not in a marriage like relationship. They were technically married, but they were not acting like married people for about two years before Janine died. And so Howard, now that Janine died and admitted this old will to probate, Howard is saying, well, maybe I want to get something. I'm an omitted spouse. I'm not part of this estate. Okay. And so I want my share as if Janine died without a will, which in many cases in second marriages would mean they would get at least half of the estate in Washington. They get half of the separate property if there's other children involved. And so in this case, there's children involved. So they would get half of the separate property, which is basically half the estate. And it's going to cause a problem. It's going to be a problem. It, it is a problem, right? And you can get out of that omitted spouse statute in degrees if you can show that the person's intent was not to provide for this person, this separated spouse or this omitted spouse, if they changed their mind as to what was going to happen. But in many cases, it's very hard to prove that. And typically, courts love surviving spouses. They love them, <laughs> you know, which is the way it typically goes. So a lot of the time that omitted spouse gets what they ask for. Okay. Or at least a chunk that they shouldn't be getting. Okay. A third story to consider is this. I have a, another client who came in as another probate case. The deceased person was a woman who'd been married multiple times. She was in her fourth divorce when she died, she was separated from her husband. They had filed for divorce, but before the divorce was final, she passed away. And so she did not have a will. And so this was an intestate estate. So the state says how things are going. So that typically says, if I'm a married person, 100% of my community property would go to the surviving spouse. 50% of the separate property would go if there's children of the marriage, which in this case there were. The thing that I learned this about this situation that I hadn't known before, because I had never had it come up before, and I don't do family law, is if you're in a probate or a divorce proceeding and you die before that divorce proceeding is finished, the divorce is like it never happened. It doesn't get defaulted and, well, they started it and that was the intent and so they're divorced. That's not what happens. The case goes away. The case is dismissed because there's no reason for a divorce when someone passes away. So in that case, this spouse, who in this case, nobody likes in the whole family, and he, they basically say he ruins the whole family, right? <laughs> could get the majority of this estate. And they hadn't been married or together for years, right? 
So the solution to that problem would have been do a new will when you get separated or do a new will when you start a divorce proceeding so that if you die before that divorce is final, it doesn't matter. So there's lots of issues. And I talk about this a lot as far as families go. Blended families sometimes can work great together, right? In our last episode, we talked about sibling harmony and how sometimes a family will have co-personal representatives or co-executors or co-trustees, one from each side of the family, and they work together great and make sure everything is set properly, right? Each person gets their fair share. But if you don't have the planning in place, you're going to have problems. It's just going to be a mess. And so it's important to review that stuff. This is an important topic because so many families are blended these days. And if planning is not done properly, it could really lead to a mess. And so that's what I've got for you today. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Legacy Talk. If you like today's episode and would like to learn more, please like this episode and subscribe for more great content. I've been your host, James Jones, to your legacy. Thank you for listening to the Legacy Talk podcast by attorney James A. Jones. If you found today's episode helpful, we ask that you like and follow us on all major platforms so you don't miss out on the latest episode. If you have questions for Attorney Jones, reach out at info at joneslegacylaw.com or visit our website at joneslegacylaw.com. Join us again next week for another episode of the Legacy Talk podcast.